Hey guys, this is John, and I'm taking the chess personality quiz, www.chesspersonality.com. And this is just kind of a fun thing. I saw Danny Wrench posted his chess personality. He took the quiz. I purposely did not watch his video because I didn't want to see the questions. Uh, that would kind of spoil the purpose of trying to find your chess personality. So I'm going to take this quiz, see how I do. If you guys want to take the quiz on your own and you don't want to be influenced by my answers and what you see here, I would suggest not watching this video until you take it. Okay. Um, I think I actually did this quiz about a year ago, but I don't really remember the questions. So, you know, I'm going to take it again and see what happens. And uh, if you want to, you can share your chess personality in the comments of this video. All right, let's get started. So question one, which side would you rather play in the following position? Black to move. Okay, so this is a attacking position from the looks of it because white has this open rook bearing down on black's king. If we count the material, white is down a piece though. Uh, white has presumably sacrificed a knight on d5. This is a position out of the Sicilian knight orf. And <laughs> I'm a little torn on this question because I like defending. I like holding on to material, letting my opponents try to burn themselves out with the attack. But I know a lot about this position from the white side. So I'm going to answer honestly and say I would rather be white there. When you play in tournaments, do you usually score with consistent results or do you often perform on the extremes, either really well or really poorly? Pretty consistent results. Yeah, I actually uh, have a rating that has oscillated between a very small window in the past like many years. Uh, so I am definitely going with A, pretty consistent results. I don't have great tournaments a lot of times, but I also almost never bomb a tournament. So, Which best describes how you think about this position in the Sveshnikov Sicilian? Black has given up a critically important square, d5, or black has lots of potential counterplay with the bishop pair in the f5 pawn break. Um, again, this is a position I played from the white side before, and I like the fact that that knight has d5. You notice the backward pawn on d6. White has a knight occupying the square immediately in front of that, and often the play revolves around that. Also, black's pawn structure has been damaged a bit. Uh, so I'm going to say A. I like the positional aspects of white's game there. Which statement is closer to the truth? I bring my best game when facing opponents I dislike. I don't really notice my opponent. I'm going to say I don't really notice my opponent. I'm more of the play the board, not the man. Not that I won't like change my game up based on who I'm playing, but I don't get some like extra motivation when I face someone that I personally dislike. Okay, maybe a little bit, but um, I try to play my best game all the time. So B. Black has just played g5. Your first instinct is to take on g5 or retreat to g3. Hmm. I would say definitely retreat to g3. I'm not the type who's going to sacrifice on g5. If knight takes g5 or bishop takes g5, white's going to get two pawns. Um, even if bishop takes g5, actually bishop takes f3 might be possible. Not that I'm going to analyze these positions in too much depth, but... Yeah, I would say my natural instinct would always be to pull that bishop back. I think I would look at the sacrifice second. And if I was playing this in a bullet game, I'd just be like, okay, bishop g3. So let's retreat. Do you play gambits? <laughs> this is just a yes or no question. Is there a maybe option? Like sometimes or... Yeah, I mean, by and large, I uh, don't play gambits. Can't really think of too many gambits that I play. I play the Banco Gambit for black, but that's more of like a positional gambit. I think they're talking about stuff like, you know, the Goring Gambit, um, proper gambits, the Smith Mora maybe, where you actually give up a pawn for the initiative. So nope, I'm going no on that one. How would you think about whether or not to take on G5 as white? Oh, is this the same position as before? Looks like it. I would evaluate the placement of the pieces to decide if the attack seemed promising. I would calculate several variations to decide if white's attack is strong enough. Yeah, definitely B, because, I mean, if you're a good attacking player, you play by instinct, but you also know that you have to calculate. It has to be, your sacrifices have to be backed up with specific calculations. So I wouldn't just uh, flippantly sacrifice on G5, just trusting my instincts. In a fast game, maybe, but uh, if this were a tournament game, B all the way. I'm, I'm calculating that baby out. I want to make sure I have some real strong analytical backing to my sacrifices. So let's go B. Under serious time pressure, you are more likely to miss a tactic or move a piece aimlessly. Miss a tactic. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to keep your position together and keep track of everything that's going on in the position. 
I, I rarely get in a situation where I just find myself like moving back and forth, even if I'm in extreme time pressure. So A. Which of the ideas do you prefer for white? Let's have a gander at this one. White should trade bishops and put a strong knight on d4, which will prevent any counterplay from black doubling rooks on the b file by defending c2. White should push d4, temporarily misplacing black's dark square bishop, and then start an attack on the king side with f5. Well, so a lot of this does revolve around that d4 square. That's a prime outpost for white's pieces. And being of the pers positional persuasion, uh, I like to occupy weak squares. So uh, A, looking to trade the bishops and then put a knight into d4, as I know white often does in French positions, uh, that that catches my eye more than the, the second plan, trying to start an attack with f5. Because if white pushes f5, e5 becomes weak. Not that it's not a valid plan, but that would be my thinking. I probably most of the time would prefer the safer route of just trying to get like a small positional edge here. You start the game out with d4, would you rather your opponent play d5 or f5? Hmm. I would say f5, because d5 I think is just the better move. Um, no offense to the Dutch players out there, but um, yeah, I mean, I want to give myself the best chance of winning, so I would rather face f5, have my opponent play that. You have been ahead of pawn for most of the game, but after tough resistance from your opponent, you should have only five, mes five minutes left in this position. Should you play on or offer your opponent a draw? So white's just up a clear pawn. Yeah, I would keep pushing for the win. I think if you offer a draw in this position as white and you have a lot of time, then you don't respect your chess skills. You're just up a pawn here. The onus is on black to make a draw. You know, you, you shouldn't just hand your opponent a half point in this position. So even if I'm low on time, I'm pushing for the win because I want to maximize my chances and... You know, when you're playing tournaments, you, you often don't get a lot of like second opportunities at good positions. You got to capitalize when you have the edge in your games. And uh, the other thing is, there's not that many tactics in this position. It'd be one thing if White was down a, a pawn and the position was unclear. But here, it's just an ending. It's four pawns and a knight for White versus three pawns and a knight for Black. So endings, I mean, you're not going to be faced with too many difficult decisions as you would in like a complicated middle game. So Let's push for the win. Which statement comes closest to your feelings? We're talking about feelings now. It's always a joy to be paired with someone you've crushed in the past. The odds of winning are slightly higher against opponents one has previously beat. Hmm. I'm trying not to overanalyze these questions. Like, if I answered one way, what would that say about my chess personality? I'm just trying to analyze them or answer them as honestly as I can. Huh. Yeah, I'm going to go with B. It's the less exciting answer, but it's probably true. I mean, I um, I know that there's players that I've beaten before multiple times, but I wouldn't say that I get like uh, joyous when I see that I'm paired against them. I know that that's going to play to my advantage psychologically, so uh, I factor that in, but I'm not like mentally like fist pumping, <laughs> you know, when I see the pairing. Okay, with plenty of time on your clock, what would you do in this position? Trade on e6 and play rook d7 because the endgame is good for white, or redirect the knight to c3 via a4 to preserve the better minor piece. Hmm. Invest some serious time calculating whether knight takes e6 achieves anything concrete. With plenty of time on your clock, okay, so we've got virtually as long as we need to make this decision. Hmm. I don't think I would calculate too much on this position. I mean, if you're going down the knight takes e6 route, you're going to trade that knight for the bishop, and then you're going to bring the rook in and double up your rooks, probably start marching your king in, trying to break through on the queen side. It is even material. This other plan that they're saying in A, redirect the knight to c3 via a4. I mean, I can see the value of trying to bring the knight into c3, but... I mean, knight b5 is sort of superficial, like a6 can stop it. Knight e2, yeah, I think knight a4 to c3 is too slow. It's not a terrible idea to preserve that knight, but it's not achieving anything. I think white has a, a chance to immediately uh, occupy the seventh rank with a rook, and they should seize that by taking, so. 
I guess, okay, so that falls under the umbrella of A. Yeah, I'm definitely going A. It's kind of suggesting two different plans in A, but I would do the first plan. What do you think of the famous saying, chess is 99% tactics? I think this is an exaggeration. Tactics are obviously important, and tactics can be the nuts and bolts of how you actually win a game. But uh, chess is not 99% tactics. That's way too high. <laughs> so, disagree. How do you feel about this wild gambit line for black, white to move? No way am I trying to lose. I like my chances, and this will definitely mess with my opponent. So this looks like some line where black sacrificed their rook in the corner. And what's the material count? Black is down in exchange plus a pawn. Presumably it's white to move because, oh yeah, it said that, white to move. And also white's queen is under attack. So white's queen is going to have to go somewhere. And maybe after that I can try to play bishop g7 and go after the knight. I wouldn't mind a crack at this position for black. White has nothing else developed other than the queen and the knight. So yeah, I'd take a flyer on black in this one. After losing a game, have you ever broken something or yelled out loud? No, I don't think I've pulled a Magnus Carlsen before. <laughs> I'm referencing his uh, antics in the World Blitz Championship that just uh, concluded. You can go Google that and check that out. Um, I mean, it's understandable that people get mad, but I've definitely never broken something. And I mean, I've like, I've like talked to myself after a game, maybe afterwards, like kind of, be like, John, what are you doing? Like, how could you play like that? But I've never like yelled out loud in the middle of the tournament hall. So, no. White to play in castle, kingside or queenside? Ooh. Okay, so kingside is safe. You're going the same direction as black. And queenside, if you castle queenside, there's opposite side castling and presumably white's going to launch a pawn storm in that case. That's a close call here. Close call. I think if castle's short, bishop d6, and black can try to trade the bishops, I maybe very modestly prefer white, but I don't think white's achieve anything there. So I think I would go long, and I like the fact that the bishop's on g4, because I can play h3 and attack that bishop, and white might be able to uh, spur their attack on the king side along with gain of time with a move like h3. So yeah, let's go queen side. Which is closer to the truth? I get excited or nervous before a game. I don't worry about prizes, money, titles, or honors while playing. I just play my game. Hmm. I mean, it very much depends on the game. Like, what's at stake? Uh, I would say normally it's B. But of course, like, everyone is going to get a little excited or nervous if, if something major is on the line. Like, you're playing for first place, or uh, you know you're going to hit a certain rating level if you win, or you're up against a very good player. But on the whole, I would say B. Most of the time, I just I focus on making good chess decisions. I try not to let the tournament factors influence my play. How would you come up with a plan in this position as white? Consider the strengths and weaknesses of black's position and decide where my pieces feel best. I would calculate some line for white to see how strong various possibilities are. So this is a question of whether you would play the position by instinct or by exact calculation. Usually the answer is somewhere in between, right? I mean, most chess positions, you're guided by your instincts, but you're calculating, you're backing it up. Um, nothing has been exchanged yet, and there's quite a bit of tension in the center. I think I would calculate more. I, I don't think this is a position you can play uh, just instinctively. There's, there's too much tension going on. There's too many possible pawn structures. You know, if white took on d5 or pushed e5 or just left it. So I would say b is the appropriate thing to do. Which is harder for you to do. Identify my advantages and build a plan. Building a plan. Uh, that's poor English. <laughs> Trade a good position for a strong attack. I would say b. Sometimes I um, have difficulty tearing myself away from a position I've built up and exchanging it for like an initiative. I might want to sit on that advantage I have. Identify my advantages and build a plan. I mean, you can't build a plan all the time. Uh, so always like coming up with a good plan is a challenge in chess. But I would say in this specific instance, I would go with B. All right, that concludes the quiz. And I got chess personality grinder.
Grinders are players with an unassuming style that can hide just how intent they are on winning. They don't need to know opening theory to beat you. They don't need to have an advantage to beat you. That's a nice aspect of being a grinder. They don't even need to have an equal position to beat you. Grinders have good positional skills and are usually most at home in end games. They are attuned to their opponent's weaknesses, which they use against them. On the other hand, they often know their own strengths and limitations pretty objectively and will make good practical decisions. It's hard to take advantage of a grinder's weaknesses, and you won't have much luck getting errors out of them by applying pressure. I would say that's pretty accurate. Uh, you know, I would say most of that is a good synopsis of my style. I definitely prefer to uh, beat people slowly, and I like playing end games. I like converting small advantages. Uh, I like minimizing risks. Um, I don't always play like that, but that's kind of my default style. And here we have kind of the spectrum attacking to positional, aggressive to solid, intuitive calculating. So I'm definitely more on the positional end of the spectrum, but aggressive positional versus solid positional. I'm not quite sure what to make of that. Intuitive. Yeah, I'd say I'm slightly more of an intuitive player. Maybe not even slightly, like definitely more of an intuitive player. Very calm, apparently. Not so emotional about chess. Okay, and, and Anatoly Karpov is my spirit chess player. <laughs> yeah, I love Karpov. He's one of my favorite players. Um, I've studied a lot of his games, so that makes perfect sense. Okay, so obviously uh, the chess personality quiz is not an exact science, but um, if you guys are interested, take the quiz and uh, it's just a fun thing to do. Let me know what you came up with. So thank you guys for watching and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.